make sure I get this right. Take our Bibles, not hymnals. Let's take our Bibles. Let's go to Revelation chapter 20. Bum, bum, bum. Revelation chapter 20, verse 1. Says, and I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years." What I'd like to preach about tonight is how your eschatology affects your works. Your eschatology affects your works, what you do for Christ. Um, that, and eschatology, that's the way you view the end times. Okay? <clears throat> I'm going to go through the four kind of major generalized uh, beliefs go over each uh, of the works that, uh, that they produce, and then kind of a one verse debunk uh, for the false views. So we've got, uh, and I'm not going to belabor the first one, which would be historic premillennial. Um, pastor has been uh, preaching a series going through Revelation, um, and <clears throat> we would agree with the kind of generalization of uh, that pattern, a historic premillennial view. Uh, but I'm going to go through and just show you how each view kind of views the Gentiles and the church, you know, the, or I'm sorry, the church and Israel, uh, the kingdom, what the kingdom is, uh, and then the rapture, uh, whether we, there will be a rapture, whether it's before the millennium, there is no millennium, or it's post-millennium. So uh, the first one, historic premillennial. The uh, historic premillennial uh, believes that the church is, uh, if you will, the Gentiles were added to the fold of believers. There were believers in Israel. And they were in the fold, and Jesus said that he was going to add sheep that were not of that fold. He was going to add believers. And that is where uh, the rest of the believers come from. God gave Israel a specific mission. There were believers that were in Israel, uh, but there were also believers that were in physical Israel that weren't of the nation of Israel. And we see that, that mission to the world uh, expanded after Jesus' uh, death, burial, and resurrection. Uh, historic premillennial also holds that uh, the kingdom is spiritual now and that there will be a physical kingdom here on the earth in the millennial reign of Christ. Uh, also that uh, there is a rapture and that it is premillennial, meaning the rapture happens before Jesus Christ sets up his millennium, and we believe that that is pre-wrath, not necessarily before the tribulation happens, but before God pours out his wrath. There's also dispensational premillennial, uh, which is pretty popular. That's probably one of the most popular views. Uh, they divide the Gentiles in Israel, say that they're totally different. The church in Israel, two separate things, and they've got... Uh, two different veins of uh, prophecy for each one. They also divide uh, the kingdom of heaven, which ironically they say is 
Israel's earthly kingdom, the kingdom of heaven is an earthly kingdom, and that the kingdom of God is the spiritual kingdom <clears throat> that, uh, that the church partakes in. And that the rapture is before the pre, uh, tribulation, pre-trib rapture. Amillennial believes that uh, uh, kind of the same things where the Gentiles were added uh, to Israel, a uh, spiritual kingdom now and a physical kingdom later. Uh, but they believe in kind of like a yo-yo rapture, I've heard it called, <clears throat> where everything is fulfilled, rapture up to Jesus in the clouds and right back down. It's like, okay, that's a little interesting. <laughs> and then in the name, a millennial, no literal millennial reign of Christ, meaning Christ is uh, with a thousand years that it's not a literal thousand years. They believe it has started when Jesus uh, was resurrected and that it's just kind of a figurative, uh, figurative thing. A lot of those things have been fulfilled and we're moving on through. Uh, Post-millennial teaches that uh, the church is the new Israel, that the church fulfilled, uh, is fulfilling or replacing um, Israel in the Bible, and they believe in a physical kingdom that they are tasked with building on this earth. Uh, they believe the millennium, the thousand years, is, again, figurative, uh, but that they are tasked with building uh, that physical kingdom for Jesus Christ in kind of a golden age where everybody gets saved, practically, uh, before Jesus comes back and defeats death. That's Jesus' only job uh, in the millennium, apparently, according to the post-millennials. Um, so... With those different views, and I know some of that was a mouthful, but with each of those things, it does generate kind of your perceived notion of what you should be doing for Jesus while you're here on this earth. Um, I'm not going to go over the um, uh, in depth the uh, historic premillennial because we all know that that's that's kind of the the uh, majority held view here at this church, and we believe that we are um, tasked with preaching the gospel. We're building a uh, spiritual kingdom for Jesus Christ, souls that will be in his uh, spiritual and physical kingdom in the future, and we're tasked to do that now because we know that there is a day coming when it's going to be a lot more difficult to do that. There is a tribulation coming that we will have to um, fight the devil, right? Uh, we're doing it spiritually now, but there will be a time when it is physical, right? And we, uh, we've got it easy right now, so we should be working hard uh, because we've got a deadline coming. Just like uh, when everyone saw COVID, there are, there are a bunch of people who had different reactions. There were those who were, oh no, full of fear and froze with fear. And then there were some of us who were like, okay, well, Looks like I'm buying beans and rice and <laughs> just like I'm getting prepared. I'm going to do some works to prepare for that physical, uh, that physical tribulation. Well, as, uh, as believers in the Bible, we should be preparing for God's kingdom in, in the ways that he says we should be, which is preparing people's souls spiritually. Uh, with the works <clears throat> that these other views uh, generate. First, uh, dispensational. Dispensationalism with kind of viewing the church and Israel differently, they kind of set Israel up on a pedestal. And they really do. And what that ends up promoting is kind of a financially and emotional support for an abominable, idolatrous, murderous religion. And if you're like, whoa, are you talking about Israel? Yes, I'm talking about Israel, okay? If you look over in Israel today, if Israel is the people of God, God's people, that's supposed to have a physical kingdom on this earth, take a look at their physical kingdom. They support sodomy. Tel Aviv is the capital of 
sodomy in the world, the, the LGBT, QP plus, whatever you want to call it, they brag about that. Okay, that that's their place. <clears throat> if that's supposed to be God's physical kingdom here on earth, they're lacking pretty, pretty bad. Okay, um, on top of that, um, <clears throat> they're, they're a big promoter of abortion, right? It's not God's physical kingdom on earth. But that is what a lot of, uh, unfortunately, a lot of Baptists will say, hey, Israel is God's people. They're the chosen ones. We need to send them money. I don't want to financially support that, and neither should you. Also, with dispensationalism, a secret rapture uh, before the tribulation, before tribulation even happens, has made American Christianity fat and lazy. Okay, there's, there's no kind of push, right? When you're at ease and everything's comfortable, you're sitting in the AC, you know how hard it is to go uh, plant a garden when you're sitting in the AC watching TV, yeah, come on. watching a YouTube video at the same time while listening to the radio too? You're like, <clears throat> there's, it's just, uh, it's that, it's that kind of, lazy American kind of thing, and the religion is followed into that too. And unfortunately, dispensational premillennialism feeds that. Amillennial, <clears throat> um, and for anyone out here, these are my own uh, personal observations, my own anecdotal observations. So <clears throat> if, there's, if there's dispensationalists or amillennialists or postmillennialists who don't fit into this, I probably don't know you, okay? So, <laughs> amillennial, from what I've seen, uh, is kind of an autopilot attitude. and it, uh, Everything's kind of been fulfilled. There's no real big anything until Jesus Christ comes back. Now, I will say some of that autopilot might be because most amillennials I know are also Calvinists. And Calvinists, for soul winning, um, are pretty much hands-off, autopilot, even with their own children. We've, we've seen them where they don't even give the gospel to their own children, which is lunacy, okay? It's wicked. Yes, it is. So <clears throat> maybe, maybe with amillennialists, that's maybe more of a, not just their eschatology. Maybe that's a one-two punch from Calvinism and their eschatology. Um, and then we move on to post-millennialists works of post-millennialists is that they're motivated, they are motivated, but they're motivated in building a physical kingdom. They're motivated in building a physical kingdom, uh, primarily politics. I did go to a, a, a political meeting uh, a few weeks ago. Um, I was invited there and I said, sure, why not? I'll see what, what it's about. And the individual who spoke, pretty good speaker, um, Talked to him about religion afterward, and he was post-millennial. Um, he had some sort of creed or something. I can't remember. <laughs> Baptist confession of something. And um, the post-millennial view, though, is what had led him into politics. So instead of preaching the gospel and changing people's hearts for Jesus Christ, we're going with a top-down method of let's get these one or two people who then can force a whole population to kind of superficially have a, a Christian sheen, if you will. All right? <clears throat> not, not a good method in, in, my, uh, in my estimation. As well as that, with the post-millennial view, I believe that they will be discouraged and, and pretty much kind of fall away from the faith, if you will, if you follow a post-millennial eschatology. Because is politics getting any better? Is the U.S. getting any better? Is the world getting any better? No, it's not. <laughs> Hope deferred maketh the heart sick. Right? If you think, hey, I'm going to get this, and then, well, maybe it'll be next week or next year or the next election cycle, you're not going to get it. You might get tiny little, 
little uh, uh, victories here and there, but it's the old, uh, you know, one step forward, two steps back kind of thing. And that's the way the world is going. So uh, let's, uh, let's look at the one verse debunks. Uh, go to Matthew 24. And to be fair, these are going to be a little bit more than just one verse. <laughs> Matthew 24. Let me see if I can get there. It's not in the Old Testament. There you go. Matthew 24, verse 29. When we're talking about dispensationalism, the rapture is not secret, nor is it pre-trib. Uh, verse 29 says, immediately after the tribulation of those days, after the tribulation of those days, shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her, uh, her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven uh, shall be shaken, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, and he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other." We see here, it's pretty, pretty clear that this is the rapture. And you'll hear a lot of uh, pre-tribbers, dispensationalists, quote from Matthew 24 showing what, what kind of things show that the rapture is close. And then they read verse 29 through 31, and they're like, well, that's not the rapture. <laughs> right? It's, Take the whole thing or throw it out. What do you want? Right? You get the word tribulation from this passage. <laughs> to say that you're pre-trib. And it says the rapture is immediately after the tribulation and that all the tribes of the earth will mourn when they see the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. They see the Son of Man coming. It's not secret, okay? And, and the people who are mourning see the Son of Man coming, not just the Christians who are getting raptured, which is uh, kind of the position that they'll take. So that's my one verse debunk for dispensationalism. Amillennialism, let's go over to Revelation chapter 20. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 20, verse one through three. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. The amillennialists will take this passage and they'll literally say, well, the devil has been bound for a thousand years, a figurative thousand years. And they'll say he was bound when Jesus Christ died, was buried, and rose again so that he could not deceive the nations anymore. Now, let me ask you this. Is the devil deceiving people today? Amen. Is the, the devil deceiving nations today? Entire nations. If to believe that he's not deceiving entire nations, you would have to say that the Catholics are God's people, that they're believers in the Bible. You'd have to say that the Orthodox are God's people, they're believers in the Bible. You'd have to say that the Muslims are God's people and believers in the Bible, or any other secular nation, if you will, whether that be um, China or Russia or fill in the blank. Okay, so to say that the devil is bound and he was bound at the cross and that he's not deceiving people because we can go out and we can preach the gospel and the gospel can change people's minds. I get it, the gospel can. But I've preached to plenty of people the gospel, plenty of people that have heard the gospel and they go, no, nah, I'm pretty sure evolution is where it's at. No, I'm pretty sure, or no, uh, what, what's the, uh, 
not Buddhism, but Hinduism, that's the oldest religion in the world, and that's what I'm going to believe, right? <clears throat> the devil still deceives the nations, the vast majority of people in the world. And I'm pretty sure we still got a video on YouTube from Brother Jake preaching about six years ago. Uh, what percentage of people are saved in the world just based off of the beliefs of the religions? And let me tell you, it's a very small percentage. <clears throat> and then the post-millennial view. Go over to Matthew 28. And because this, uh, this kind of spurred the thought for tonight's sermon, this is going to be a, a two-passage, maybe three-passage debunk instead of just a one. So Matthew 28, verse 19 through 20. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things Whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. The postmillennialist will take this passage and say, It says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, to teach them to observe all things whatsoever I commanded you. You're going to disciple all nations, meaning, you're going to disciple the converts from all nations, meaning the majority of the nation will be saved and will be learning God's commands before Jesus Christ comes back. Thankfully, we have other gospels that also record uh, what Jesus said, right? Jesus said this, but Jesus also said uh, a few other things that clarify the command he's giving here. He is not giving the command that you need to convert entire nations and disciple entire nations. <clears throat> but that is what the postmillennial view teaches. Uh, I'm going to go over to Luke 24, 46. You can stay, stay there in Matthew 28. So I'm going to go to Mark 16 first. In verse 15... The parallel to this in Mark says, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Now, does he say that you have to disciple them there? Does he say you have to teach them? Does he say anybody's getting saved? He just says, Preach the gospel. That's the goal. Preach the gospel. Over in Luke 24. Verse 46, we see something similar. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures and said unto them, thus it is written and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations. Beginning at Jerusalem, and ye are witnesses of these things. He told them, go and preach the gospel among all the nations. He did not promise that all the nations, the vast majority of the individuals in every nation, would be saved. He said, you're to witness what you had seen. Those disciples were to witness what they saw of Jesus. So, the Bible here, even using their passage of the Great Commission, disproves that a majority of individuals will be saved from every nation. Uh, and then, as you know, the world is not getting any better. Because the post will tell you that, hey, we're building on top of the next, the, the last uh, great Christian gain and the world's going to get better and better and better until Christ can't stand it anymore and he comes back. All right, pretty much is the view. <clears throat> and he just takes care of death. But over in 2 Timothy chapter 3, we see a little different story. Pastor quoted this this morning. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 12 says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. All 
not just the Christians in the first, second, third, fourth century until Rome took over and then it started getting better from there, right? It's all Christians that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution from when Jesus died all the way up until Jesus comes back. And then it says, but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. The world's gonna get worse. And that's what the Bible clearly say, states. And uh, these, these views of eschatology miss the mark in, in some key things and they foster the wrong focus for Jesus Christ. We need to focus on preaching the gospel. We need to focus on discipling individuals that receive the gospel so that then we can send more laborers into the harvest. And that is the focus. And if we change those hearts for Jesus Christ, maybe he blesses us and gives us a little bit of a, a reprieve. Maybe, maybe we do get a little bit of political peace, right? That's an afterthought. That is not the goal, okay? And unfortunately, with some of these other views, that is the goal and not the byproduct. So I'd encourage everyone, let's keep preaching the gospel. Let's pre preach to our families, all right? Convert our children and uh, preach that, hey, Jesus Christ is coming back. There will be a tribulation and there will be a point when it's, beyond the decision-making time, both if you die or if uh, that rapture happens and, and you may be given that strong delusion as uh, 2 Thessalonians says. So let's keep preaching the gospel for Jesus Christ. Lord, thank you so much for uh, 